Hello, good evening, welcome everybody. While people are still uh, dropping in and finding a place, I wanted to welcome you all to an event in our series platform, which is Bergen Kunsthal's series of talks, conversations, and presentations around questions in art uh, and uh, broader culture. And we have the extreme pleasure to welcome today here with us Chris Kraus who's visiting us for a reading. And uh, the talk takes place basically in relation to uh, an exhibition we're showing at the moment, uh, Jill Johnston, The Disintegration of a Critic, about the American writer, critic, and legendary lesbian icon and cultural figure, Jill Johnston, which we opened a couple of weeks ago in number five and which will be here on view um, until the 11th of uh, August. Um, the talk is also part of an informal series, we could say, uh, that we organized and started in the past uh, months that center around writing as a cultural practice, which has become an interesting model uh, for us to think about uh, production and reflection and as a mode, an active mode of uh, discourse. And, uh, Chris Krauss is certainly an incredibly important uh, person, writer, producer in this respect for us, and uh, I guess in a wider sense. Um, she's known as a writer and publisher and critic, and uh, maybe most notably for a novel that's already a bit older, I Love Dick from 1997, which recently has found um, incredibly wide acclaim and uh, has been turned into a TV series um, uh, directed by Jill Soloway for Amazon in 2016. Other books more recent include uh, Summer of Hate, uh, published in 2012 and recently uh, translated to Swedish and uh, most recently uh, a collection of essays uh, titled uh, Social Practices and uh, another book also to mention uh, after Kathy Acker, a literary biography, which was published in 2017. And uh, Chris has been for many years uh, uh, the co-editor of the influential publishing house Semitexte, together with Sylvain Lautranger and Heidi L. Colti, uh, that uh, is still incredibly active and uh, uh, in influential and based in uh, New York, I think, still. Yes. And uh, Chris also produced uh, films between two, uh, 1982 and 1995, and um, uh, they're actually currently completely on view in, uh, at the in Exhibition Space Index in Stockholm, in case somebody happens to pass by. But today, uh, Chris has prepared a selection of texts that uh, look especially at the boundaries of art criticism and writing, uh, which responds, in a way, to our invitation during this time in parallel to the exhibition about Jill Johnston. And she will also talk a bit about, uh, share some reflections about Jill Johnston and uh, the long-lasting legacy of herself. So we're very happy to have you here. It's uh, going to be a talk for about uh, 40, 45 minutes. And afterwards, we will also have um, the possibility of questions. Yes, one maybe one sorry one more practical remark, which is that uh, this event is live streamed, so we have two cameras here and over there. So in case you feel uncomfortable being on uh, live stream, please <laughs> um, move a bit away from the camera. I guess is the suggestion I can give. Okay, great. Thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you, Jonas, Sofia, for preparing the events. Thank you, Maria, for organizing everything, and. Uh, Please enjoy Chris Kraus. Axel, thank you. Um, have most of you seen the exhibition in the other room, uh, the Jill Johnston exhibition? A lot of you have, or at least know who she was. Do people know who she was? Um, I'm going to read some of my own, I guess, quote unquote, art writing, as we call it now, um, and talk about it a little bit. 
But it's very much, whatever I read, I feel, is very much being read in the shadow of Jill Johnston's influence and work. Um, it's amazing, well, a couple of things. First, Jill Johnston herself. It's amazing how prescient her work was um, in terms of what the fashions are now in the art world to deviate from traditional analytical criticism and theoretical criticism and give a more experiential account of the work. Um, I mean, Jill was experiential to say the least. Um, her work took place, I guess, between 1960 and the mid-70s, the most important parts of it. She was a dance critic for The Village Voice, and she wrote about art. But what was incredible about her writing was um, there were long, long columns. You know, it's a, it's a lot of pressure, anyone who's ever written journalistically, to come up with a weekly column of about 2,000 words. That's, that's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of work. And um, she did this for years at The Voice. And she was a pioneer, I guess, of this kind of poetic, digressive criticism that penetrates to the heart of the work. I mean, she was an incredible observer, an incredible audience of visual art and of dance and performance. Um, but she also, at the same time, is feeding back what the life of the work is socially and the community that she's living with, how other people are seeing it, how it's being shown, what its place is in the world. And she's also feeding back what her experience is of seeing the work of that time. So all of these things, I mean, the title of this book, Social Practices, it's, I mean, it was kind of ironic for me to give the book that title because I'm sure you know there's this genre now in the art world that's been prevalent for at least a decade known as social practice where artists will go into the quote community and do a project with people that they will most likely never see again. Um, so I'm a little skeptical of that genre. But on the other hand, I believe that art is essentially always a social practice, and people don't recognize that enough. But Jill's work totally manifests that. I mean, she was part of a really fertile artistic community in New York during those years. And um, to read her now is not just to read criticism of the artists that she's dealing with, but it's to get a, you know, a history and a historiography of what it might have felt like, what the texture of that time felt like, what the relations between people were, the gossip, the friendships. It's really incredible. She was a huge influence on me. I think maybe I discovered her via Eileen Miles. You could definitely say the same thing about Eileen Miles' criticism. Um, one of the people um, in those newspapers that are blown up on the wall, the poet Stephen Dunn, and I think that he must have been very, very young at that point, and now he's kind of a, a real grease eminence, um, but he's like a young poet at that point, and he said this really insightful thing about Jill's work, about you, one of the ways that you would describe it or characterize it is the way that she holds so many things at the same time in relation to a work. I mean, she's, she's juggling all these balls and they seem to be unrelated. They seem, it seems as if she's talking about a lot of disparate things. But as the piece goes on, it turns out that these things are not disconnected at all. They're deeply connected. And in a way, she's finding the connections in her own body as she experiences and processes the work. So, I mean, I'm beyond a fan, and um, I highly recommend the exhibition and the beautiful book that goes with it. Bruce Hanley and Jennifer Krasinski both wrote amazing things about Jill's work. Everyone wants to pick up on her now. I know, you know, I have younger friends, like just out of art school in LA, who are talking about Jill Johnston and wanting to do projects about her and republish her. Um, so, yeah, she. Bruce said something interesting in his essay about her, that she never wrote a novel, and she described all of her work not as criticism, not as like art writing. She just called it writing. And um, I definitely, I feel that way about my work. 
I wrote the biography of the writer Kathy Acker, and Acker said the same thing. I mean, she would, you know, sometimes if she was like trying to be legitimate or fancy, she'd talk about as herself as a novelist, but she didn't really believe that. I mean, really, she saw her work as writing. And the pieces that I'm going to read now, I, mean, I would characterize them the same way. Sometimes they were commissioned by an artist or an art institution, but I feel like they're just writing. You know, they're writing to the work. They're writing alongside it. I mean, they're almost, it's almost everything except about the work. I mean, maybe on some level it's about the work, but it's also very much about what it's like to exist alongside the work. So, let's see, what am I going to read first? Um, this piece here, Posthumous Lives, this was um, written in 1999 or 2000, and I had just really started writing about art. Um, I was invited to write a column for the now defunct magazine Art Text. Um, it was a quarterly column, and at that point I knew so little about art and the art world that I felt, oh, I can just do anything. And it always kind of amazed me what happens to people's work when they die and what happens to their reputation and how those reputations and careers are managed after the artist's life or not managed the way some work survives and some work disappears. So I wrote a series of columns, maybe two or three pieces, called Posthumous Lives, where I talked to some people who had become executors of other artists' work. This piece, I think I'm talking about Penny Arcade. Do you know who she is? Has her news of her work reached her? She's an incredible performance artist. She must be in her 70s now. She's still performing. When she was a baby, she was part of Andy Warhol's factory. And she left New York for a long time. And then she came back and sort of reinvented herself as a solo performer, a monologist. Her first show was called Bitch, Dyke, Fag, Hag, Whore. Um, that was in the 80s. And she's always kind of feeding New York back to itself. She's a great improviser and ad-libber. So I mean, if this was a Penny Arcade show, first I'd be taking my clothes off. And then second, you might be heckling me. And then third, I would be coming back with the greatest rejoinders. And the whole performance you know, would turn out to be a dialogue between, between me and the heckler. I mean, she's an improvisatory genius. Um, anyway, also, she's my friend. And uh, she volunteered when no one else wanted the job to be the executor of the artist Jack Smith. So I wrote about visiting Penny and visiting the remains or the cremains of Jack Smith in Penny's apartment. A conceptual artist I know in New York City keeps a card file of everyone important he's ever met. Each card contains the important person's name and contact info, the occasion on which they met, a recollected transcript of the conversation, Additional information like sexual habits, recreational preferences, achievements, birthday, spouse's name may be added later as it becomes available. Through his diligence, this artist has succeeded in becoming a semi-art world name. Meaning and value are completely arbitrary. I think the card file is this artist's greatest work. It's a real crapshoot, Carol Schneeman says about the chances that an artist's work may survive her. We're talking about her gorgeous installation piece, Mortal Coils, a visual memorial to the lives of 15 recently deceased artist friends, all exhibited widely in their lifetimes. But in the few ensuing years, the works of several of these people have already disappeared into the legal limbo lands of estate battles, attics, garage dumps, and storage bins. Best known as a structuralist film and video maker in the 70s and 80s, Paul Charit's subliminally fast-cut flicker films previsaged, previsaged digital effects in MTV. As Schneeman notes, he made these exquisite, exquisite tiny mosaics of color that are orchestrated visually, like visual music. He was influential in taking film back 
into the primacy of the frame. But when he died in Buffalo in 1993, Sharitz was, li was living virtually in the street, and he left no will or executor. Five years later, Schneemann says, no one knows where his work is. It's important for artists to gain a certain cachet prior to their death, Alice Gingeris, a curator at New York's Guggenheim Museum, says. Certain mythologies are sealed by the fact that the artist died. Because, she says, a lot of critical speculation comes into being after their death. This whole aura develops around the reputation of the artist because of the way their life is narrativized by the person who takes it over. Posthumous life, of course, has got to be one of the most grandiose of all vain dreams. Still, the, the dead cannot keep card files, make phone calls, go to openings, or realign their work with every curatorial shift in critical discourse. Therefore, who they're represented by and how is of primary importance. I was in New York City, so I decided to chat with someone who manages dead artists' careers. A visit to the theater artist Penny Arcade is always a little like the moment in Fellini's Roma when Anna Magnani flings open her apartment door. Or else it's like Veronique Fial's 1998 book of glamour portraits, Women Before 10 AM. It's always before 10 AM in Penny Arcade's apartment. Penny's premises have recently expanded to an additional floor of a Lower East Side walk-up building that's perennially on the verge of being condemned by the housing authority. The new floor is where she keeps the artist Jack Smith's ashes. Outside the window on the fire escape are six of 14 potted trees, the rest are on the rooftop, that Arcade inherited from the late photographer and artist co-op member Sheila Bacall. Maintained by Becal until her death in 1995, each of these pots contains the ashes of one of 14 more dead artists. Penny Arcade was a close friend of legendary camp artiste and theorist Jack Smith for decades in New York. When Jack died of AIDS in 1989, she became his death mother. He named her as executor, and it's in her loft that Jack's spirit of aesthetic delirium most vigorously lives on. Penny recalls a moment several days before Jack's death. His room was crammed with visitors, including Allen Ginsberg, Ira Cohen, Augusta Machado. And when Penny came in and started cleaning up around his bed, Jack crooned, oh, if only I had a mother like you in my life, I wouldn't have been so miserable. Penny replied, everybody has a birth mother, Jack, but you can have a death mother too. I'll be your death mother. How is it that you know how to take such beautiful care of Jack? Ginsburg asked, leaning forward. What I was doing, Penny recalls, is acting. I'm a very good actress. I was pretending that all these tubes coming out of Jack were perfectly normal, that thus dissipating the anxiety in the room, which was not only about Jack's feelings about being in this condition in front of Allen Ginsberg, but Allen's anxiety about seeing it. I turned to Alan and said, it's because I love Jack. And Jack got up, and with all the strength he had, he said to Alan, it's because I'm not a walking career like you. We're drinking coffee in the other room up in the annex. Penny's recently quit smoking. We're passing back and forth the pickle jar containing some of Jack's remains. People pick it up, she giggles, and say, oh, what's this? And I say, oh, that's Jack, and they freak. That's what you end up with after everything is gone, bone fragments. The skin burns up and what's left is chunky. But I like having him around. I like having Jack around. The idea of death, she says, it's very small and hard, but if somebody is holding your death with you, the death relaxes, it fluffs up and expands and reveals itself to you. We're all afraid of death. But ever since I was very young, I had this idea that your death is always with you. It's not something that shows up at the end of your life. We walk with our death, and when I've carried somebody's death with him, that's a very special collaboration because it's conceptually holding the idea of death and letting it expand. Death is a screen for your life to be projected onto its, in its entirety. It's very rich, like the plushest velvet. 
It's slit, it's thick, it's slow, it's luxurious. And Shirley Bakel understood this very well. In the year following Smith's death, Arcade made an extraordinary effort to preserve and maintain the Sistine Chapel of the Underground that was Jack Smith's apartment. It was a time, she says, it was a room, she says, that by its very construction would expand your consciousness and make you weep. The layering of paint, the tile, the Arab minarets around the bathtub. Jack didn't believe in shortcuts. The walls were imbued with living meaning that resonated whether he was there or not. None of Jack's former friends, she says, except for Jack himself, Bacall, Machado, and the film critic Jay Hoberman were able to see the value of maintaining the apartment as a museum to his work and ideas. Some people were eager to grab Jack's $250 a month lease within days of his death, even though it was a seven-story walk-up. But more extraordinarily, there was no interest among museums or art institutions at that time in becoming involved in the preservation. After 18 months of single-handed curatorial effort, Arcade finally gave up, documenting the space herself and placing all removable parts in storage. When PS1 mounted the exhibition Jack Smith, Flaming Creatures of Smith's work, the exhibition filled eight galleries. All the material in the show was transported from the storage bins that Penny had maintained and paid for all those years and her 800 square foot loft. Still, perhaps because Arcade is an artist, PS1 curator Ed, Ed Leffingwell was loath to follow her advice regarding the contextualization of Smith's work. They were looking for a hook, Arcade recalls, and that hook seemed to be about beatnik's homosexuality and garbage. The show received mixed notices, and it didn't travel. Whereas I feel that Jack had five ideas, in the words of the poet Rene Ricard, five huge ideas, and the public wasn't guided towards them. But then the conversation shifts again before she tells me what they were. We drink another cup of coffee, and then we go outside. Penny takes me to a jewelry fabricator storefront two blocks away on Essex Street. As she unlocks the padlock to the accordion gate outside the grimy plate glass window and swaps greetings with the Chinese sweatshop foreman on the stoop, I realize she's a kind of unofficial mayor. It's in the back room of the storefront in boxes stacked on temporary shelves that Arcade stores the prints and negative that comprise three decades of Baikal's photographic work. The boxes were collected from the street. When Baikal died, died in 1995, there was no money left in her state in her state for professional conservation. Still, her legacy remains preserved so long as Penny keeps this up. Penny opens up the boxes, and as we look at the large, gorgeously hand-printed black and white portraits, I feel as if I'm entering a secret history of the Lower East Side. Once a Ford agency model, Bacall took photos all her life. In 1968, she gave up modeling went to Europe and joined the Artist Co-op, a group that produced the environmental installations with her friend, the late Paul Tech. Back in New York, Bacall continued photographing the flaming creatures, jag queens, runaways, and burlesque stars who were once Smith's contemporaries, roaming Second Avenue before it was a yuppie feeding trough of outdoor bistros, when it was still an outpost of the Lower East Side. The photographs are visually stunning. Everyone is dead now, but captured in their self-invented splendor at the height of Rococo. There's performance artist Ethel Eichenberger playing the accordion in rhinestone shades. Eichelberger suicided so as not to be a burden on his friends before he died of AIDS. When his friend Ron Botter suggested they apply for grants to defray Ethel's medical expenses, he replied, but Ron, I'm a drag queen. They don't give grants to drag queens. Because images bring me back to a time I vaguely knew, one that has so far escaped professional art history. Still, I worry about their future. Remembering Gendros's comments about the importance of the artist's reputation being solidly in place before her death, I say, but Penny, Shelley Bacall was not an art star. When you get down to the year 3050, Penny snaps back, 
Shelley Bacal led an artistic life. She did great work. She spent her entire lifetime developing and honing her aesthetic. That's what an art star is to me. As Schneemann says, it's a crapshoot. Thanks. Well, are people here familiar with the work of, um, I'm going to have a drink, the work of uh, Lucy Stahl? She's never shown in Norway. She's an Austrian artist. Um, she was living in the US for a while. Anyway, um, the next piece I'm going to read, I think, is something that I wrote for Lucy Stahl. And um, I'm going to read two of these. One about the artist Kate Newby. Is she known here? Yeah, OK, great, great. So in both of these cases, I was invited by these artists to write something about their work for a pamphlet or catalog or something that would go together with an exhibition. And um, in both cases, I never met them. I never even got to see the work in person. They just sent me JPEGs of the work, and I would print them out and hang them up over my desk and live with them for a while. And so in both cases, I guess what I was trying to do was more stage an encounter between myself and the work and record something of that encounter rather than say anything that definitive about the work. So in the case of Lucy Stahl, um, I don't know. I went back and forth between my own diary and Lucy Stahl's work. So this piece cuts back and forth between my diary and Lucy Stahl. It's called A History of Destabilization for Lucy Stahl, 9-7-2000 something. I'm in the car with my mother in upstate New York, about to turn myself into the police. We are in Northville. I've been charged with first degree murder for advocating abortion, and I'm about to be put to death. First, we go into a church. There's a bookstore in the nave, reading material for those about to be executed, but they only have cookbooks. Plan your last meal. I think I don't want to die at the hands of these people. Decide then to flee to Canada, obtain false ID, and teach in a school. Stranger, I had this dream that my mom was in a terribly difficult situation. I was watching her life on TV like she was a stranger. This is Lucy Stahl now. There was something about her that felt familiar, very known to me. But then again, suddenly I knew she was running for president of the United States. She was sort of a Hillary Clinton type with my mom's face and hair all done up and proper. When she gave her first public statement, she was speaking in this very formal way, explaining how she had just had so much sex with my dad in the car right before the interview. Somehow, the way she was saying it made it clear that her being the presidential candidate gave her the freedom and authority to openly talk about her sex life in public. And that's Lucy Stahl, stranger. 9.30, 2000-something. Midday heat drives me out of the room. I cruise this Mexican beach town's only paved street. Finally, I stop at a fish taco stand under a giant palapa. It's a nice place, a tall bamboo bar, square tables covered with the retro oilskin cloth patterned with tropical fruit that they sell by the yard in a Los Feliz gift store. A young girl takes my order, and a woman, her mother, prepares a fish taco. I'm not really hungry, but I don't want to be rude. Forcing myself to eat, I wonder if the proprietor has modeled her restaurant on the third world themed cafes that have sprung up in LA's hipper neighborhoods. There's a TV over the counter, and the daughter keeps flipping the channels, the same 426 channels I subscribe to at home, in a half-hearted attempt to keep up with the culture. It's a real bloodfest carnival up there on Sky Cable. People outside a federal courthouse pr protesting a judge's decision not to sentence a killer to death, and then luxury life, and then QVC shopping. 
On Fox, Bill O'Reilly refers to a politician as that frigid pear-shaped bitch. Oh, right, he's talking about Hillary Clinton. And then a reality show about dating. Invited by Lucy Stahl to respond to her gorgeous and trashy collage posters, I look back in my diary and I'm surprised by the number of parallels in our dreams and notation. I've never met Lucy Stahl, but we live in the same world of oil spills, palm fronds, novelty keychains, and sports beverages. Like me, she's a self-appointed reporter. Stahl's posters begin with her odd inclination to write down fragments of overheard conversations, ambient thoughts, and fleeting anxieties that, once preserved, function as video grabs from the deluge of information that we understand more or less to comprise consciousness. Patriotic Impulse, that's the title of the work, finds Stahl in LA somewhat perplexed by a companion's vehement refusal to ever use metaphors. Approaching the large, vaguely shaped, uh, vaguely eagle-shaped boulder alongside the freeway, from which the Eagle Rock neighborhood takes its name, her companion complains, the thing doesn't even look like a bird. The patriotic impulse is deadly. And Stahl agrees. Her friend, a child of the 50s, grew up in Los Angeles, born, a car, born in a car aloft by the freeway. Months later, she passes the boulder again with a younger companion who has no idea that the rock's name was ever meant to be metaphorical. He thought it was named for an eagle because of the tremendous white stain running down the face of the rock, which as a child he took to be bird shit. And I wonder about this, if our expectation that something will mean something or not is generational. Language dislodges like rocks in a landslide as Stahl places this deceptively slight text inside the scanned image of an Armani handbag. In Am I a Scanner, she reads a self-help book and worries that she might have the same personality type known as a scanner. Scanners, she reads, are deluged by so many interests they can't decide what to do. They have no clue whether to write a novel, become a dog trainer, or move to the south of France but she's already a scanner. The whole project is completely ADD. In fact, a celebration of attention deficit disorder. All of Stahl's posters begin with fragments of text, but since she's a visual artist, she understands that these writings are not the real work, but triggers in a longer associative process. Often the small stories and observations she records remind her of banal everyday objects. She gathers these things, arranges them alongside the triggering text, and then covers it all in thick, shiny, homemade polyurethane plastic. To look at these works is to gaze deep down into a clear polyurethane pl lake. The scanned objects lie deep at the bed and function as a weirdly curated time capsule. Not waving, but drowning. A scanner, she writes, is somebody who's surfing the surface. Stahl's posters strike me as a strange manifestation of Antonin Artaud's psycho psych yeah, psychotically prescient post-war paranoia. And here I'm quoting from Artaud to pass Final Judgment on God that was written in 1947. Yesterday I heard, maybe I'm out of touch, maybe it's just an urban myth, one of those foul pieces of gossip that circulates between the sink and the toilet at the hour when meals that have been ingurgitated one more time are excreted again. Yesterday, I heard that one of the most sensational practices in American public schools, and this leaves no doubt that America sees itself as the acme of progress, is the seminal fluid, or sperm test, which is one of the many official exams given to kids on their first day of school. Each child is made to deposit a small amount of sperm into a jar, which can be stored for future artificial inseminations, because more and more Americans are finding out that they lack both muscles and children, not workers, but soldiers. And they want to ma manufacture these soldiers by any means possible, at any cost, in order to wage interplanetary wars in the future that will indisputably prove the excellence of American products. <laughs> From my diary. 12.30, 2000 something, bus ride to Pachutla. The tall, ponderosa pine trees look wet in the sun. 
My computer was robbed in Oaxaca at the second class bus terminal. I am bereft and incompetent, but in thinking back, now I recall everything, the whole chain of events leading up to the robbery. I was standing on the right side of the gate outside the crowded, bewildering terminal and bought a flan topped with, topped with jello from a street vendor to eat on the bus. Opening my backpack to put the jello away, I saw, very intensely saw, the silver flash of my power book. The thief saw it too. I saw him seeing it, his face pinched with what felt at the moment like hate, but was probably more like intent. And then the bus started boarding. While I was trying to load my bag under the bus like everyone else, a man pushed me back. Was he the driver's assistant refusing to take my bag? Confused and jostled, I started dragging it up the bus steps. And at that moment, the first man unzipped my pack from behind and took the computer. And I knew right away it was gone. Once I'd, stopped on the, once I'd stepped onto the bus, I opened my pack and saw it was missing. Forgetting the word ladron, I just howled thief, thief over and over again. The driver still outside on the curb shrugged. A busload of blank Mayan faces stared all around me. And then I could not find the ticket for my numbered seat and stood in the aisle completely confused as people pushed past with their sacks and china bags. Finally, an old man offered the seat beside him. He crossed himself before the bus departed, crossed himself each time the bus passed one of the dozens of roadside cruzais, marking the spots where cars and buses have skidded off the treacherous road into a canyon. I feel extremely disabled, straining so hard to hear. I can't notice anything happening simultaneously. The end of multitasking. I am listening, don't disturb me, I am listening. 1231, 2000 something. I am misdiagnosed with terminal cancer. Then I'm robbed. Lucy Stahl writes to me I've been working on these scanned posters for three or four years. Before that, I'd been working with scanned images from books, which I turned into kind of 3D collages. The titles of these images were always important, and a set of them also created for me a sort of loose and strange narrative with somehow violent aspects natural resources, plastic, female factor, all the same stuff that appears now, but I think nobody else got it. After a while, I got more interested in what happened in the black frame around the books, which is what happens when you leave the cover of the scanner open. And I started working with objects and text directly on the scanner. From my diary, 12, 31, 2000 something continued. As a spinster school teacher, I bring my whole class to my old spinster school teacher's retirement party. She's already started her speech, and I have to stumble across the front row of well-dressed married women, fur coats piled on their laps, angry glan angrily glancing at me while I repeat, I'm hearing impaired, pardon me. The first time Michael came over, we were playing a BDSM game. My face turned toward the wall, hands clasped, back arched, etc. He paced a short line behind me in front of the couch, and I realized just made, I can't hear him at all. Last month, I consulted a psychotherapist after getting back to LA from the tour. My left eye had started to uncontrollably twitch. I felt a constant desperation about my career. If I did not establish myself as a serious writer in the coming months, I'd be too old and desperate to do this. I'd been writing these little text scribbles notes before, this is Lucy, but never turned them into actual text. They were more like a collection of ideas, very loose sentences I wanted to remember. I never liked the sound of my text until I realized I could write in English and therefore create a distance to my somewhat diary-like diary text, at least for my own taste. That's Lucy. Imperfect language, things misheard, mistranslation, like the artist and writer Josef Strahl, like Joseph Conrad, Strahl writes in a language not quite her own to render the familiar in all its strangeness. From my diary, 12, 31, 2000 something, coming back from the tour, I was upset because the reviews had been the usual sneer fest about my confessional writing. I thought if I could be more famous, my writing would finally be read seriously. I told the therapist during our first consultation, I need to be much more famous. He said, 
I think your father is here in this room. This sounded absurd. It's nothing to do with my father. My father, the Y chromosome of ambition, he was timid, a mouse. I thought, leave my father alone. Although, in retrospect, I, I guess, I suppose there's a degree of empathic, empathic regret, the, di the desire to vindicate his misfortunes, etc. Later, I repeat this story to Michael, and he says, fuck your father. On New Year's Eve, he sent me an email wishing a year of vertical lift. But now that the computer is gone, these emails are lost. The first thing I noticed about Michael when we met at the Chateau Marmont was the right side of his face, the side facing my left, had a pronounced uncontrollable twitch. And the next day, the twitch in my eye began. Sylvia Lotringer describes neoliberalism as a negative liberalism. They want capitalism to work only for those who deserve it which means people putting into a situation where they're gonna to have to work with the economy. With no more obstacles to the flow of capital, they've decided to encourage competition and multipleism. Everyone has to turn themselves into a small enterprise. This means shaping people as both individualized and dispensable. In order to keep up with others and keep their jobs, people have to work more or less all the time the only capital now is money, career, recognition, and so you don't need a life. I think Stahl's posters chart a short history of destabilization. From my diary, 10, 15, 2000 something, Nicholas Munoz's nephew hangs himself. Two days later, the family arranges a car wash because they don't have enough money to bury him. Larry Zamora tells me he can't drive the company truck because he lost his license due to, quote, some fucked up shit when my ex-wife's ex-husband turned me in. Paul borrows $900 to post bail for his nephew who was arrested last night when his ex-wife called the cops and accused him of rape. The poor call the cops on each other. Shit happens for sure. And we enter a permanent state of unconsciousness that, once diagnosed, can be medicated towards a nadir of future amnesia. Are you a scanner? Jason emails me yesterday. You ask me to understand you, but you don't seem to understand me. If I was outraged, you would know. I'm just stating a fact. You having a headache last night has nothing to do with business, so why mention that to me? The loan will be repaid as soon as I sell my truck. As I said before, you were really free to give the white girl, Carrie, $3,000 you would never have seen again, but the black guy has to, born, has to sign over his firstborn to borrow money that will be paid back. Don't worry, I won't make that mistake again. As far as the apartment and phone, that was part of the deal, so there is no need to throw that in my face. The tone of your emails to me is that of someone talking to a child, so while checking me, you should check yourself. Like everyone else, Jason turns out to be a pathological liar. Six months later, he stages an armed robbery and leaves with $14,000 of rents from the safe. I have a very serious fight with this guy. Then he sues me for racial discrimination. Lucy Stahl writes, I've just heard a critical voice saying my, lack, my, my work would lack depth. Reflecting the present, shaving cream, scissors and glass, digital cameras, dry ramen noodles, and Armani handbag. Thanks. Um, um, let's see. I wonder, is there time to read another substantial piece, do you think? Yeah? Um, how substantial? Um, too substantial. Too substantial. Yeah, this is the Kate Newby piece, but I think maybe... No, what the hell, I'm gonna go for it. Um, splashes of color. Kate Newby sends me 12 JPEG photos. She's halfway through a two-month residency at Marfa, Texas. There's no art in the picture I'm looking at now. It's a vertical slice of high desert landscape outside of town, seen from the east generally December. 
a jagged patch of bare earth in the foreground, tall grass, a cluster of cottonwood trees on the horizon. The sun has already set, or it's about to, because everything's drenched in a rich, viscous orange-brown sunlight, a slice of the American West, worn but expansive. I've never been to this place. Looking it up on Google Maps, I see that Marfa is landlocked between two major routes of transit and commerce. 76 miles east of I-10 and 56 miles from the Mexican border. Kate Newby appears in two of these photos, and I'm curious about that. I've seen a lot of her work over the years, but we've never met. We're not connected on social media, and I've never looked for her photo, so until now I don't know what she looks like. One of the photos shows her spinning around outside a barn in a medium long shot with a lasso. She's athletic and lean with reddish blonde hair in her mid-30s, maybe. She looks like a lot of people you meet in the art world, except that her face, from what you can see in the video, looks intent and pronounced. That is, she looks somehow tougher. The other photo is just the palm of her hand displaying 12 little boot nails. I don't know what finally became of those nails if they entered one of the works. Famously, she inserts materials into incongruous places, although increasingly in recent years, she fabricates tiny sculptural objects on site as she moves between exhibitions and residencies. Often, she extends this practice to language, which is how she arrives at some of her titles. I had the idea when I got to Marfa, she writes me, to write down every phrase I heard about paying attention to where you are. I never make up sentences, but pluck them from my local situations. I'm struck by this, how Nubi takes what would be to many an exhausting condition of almost perpetual transience and folds this itinerant life into her practice. The decision seems optimistic and brave. I'm not sure what she finally did with the boot nails. She emails from Marfa in early December. I've been enjoying learning how to create work here. I'm teaching myself to sling cast metal using a fire pit, since there's no foundry. I've been collecting a lot of smashed glass that I'm chucking into some ceramics. It's so worn from the gravel, it's almost like the desert equivalent of sea glass. Three weeks later, the colored shapes of glass will move onto paper. Kate sends me a JPEG of the poster she made for her open studio. Beneath the title, swift little verbs pushing the big nouns around, there are small colored shapes. Red, blue, slate gray, deep peach, emerald green. Each little splotch of color, she emails, is a piece of broken glass I picked up off the ground and glued to some cardboard and, cardboard and then printed from. So each poster was printed seven times. The title comes from an Eileen Miles poem that appeared in Not Me, one of the first semiotext books that I edited. Everything comes around. I remember typing that poem onto my laptop from Eileen's typewritten manuscript on a cold winter day when I was living in Thurman in upstate New York, four hours north of the city. That line in the poem descri describes Eileen's understanding of German grammar. She'd been studying it, something she'd been encouraged to do by a mutual friend, the poet and translator David Rattray, who, by the way, was the translator of the Artaud fragment that I just read a moment ago. Beneath the glass shapes, Kate prints the details in black hand-painted block letters. Open studio and exhibition, Kate Newby, the Chinati Foundation Artist in Residence, January 1st, 2018, three to six. Her show will take place on the first day of the new year. This morning, December 17th, 2017, I write in my notebook, can description ever be neutral? Would the time, would I take the time, would we take the time to describe things, that is to write without an agenda? I'm thinking about this in relation to Kate Newby's work, not because the work itself is descriptive, but because it's so active, and describing it seems like the best way to approach and experience it. Description takes time, and during that time, the logic and strategy of Kate Newby's work seems to float to the surface. All of her projects enacted dramaturgy of the incongruous. She introduces new elements, often quite small, into landscapes and buildings that are already there and have been there for decades and centuries. 
Last summer in Stockholm, she put several stoneware and porcelain boulders that she'd made there herself into rivers alongside pedestrian walkways and mixed into clusters of other boulders in city parks. Some were painted Klein blue to pop, and others in mottled gray with barnacle-like shakes embedded in the faux stone, camouflaged with the real river rocks they joined. The series was called Snow Covered Everything, except it didn't because the exhibition was installed in late spring. When I asked Kate about it, she explained that she'd ripped the words from a Yelp review of Stockholm itself. In the photo documentation, Newbie's sculptural boulders seem to be at once of and outside their environments, like naturalized plants. Are they invaders or immigrants? In Marfa, Kate Newby slyly lines up her small round ceramics inside the crooks of Donald Judd's adobe wall. This kind of activity or the products of it are often referred to as interventions within art history and criticism, but I don't see Newby's work that way comprising interventions, nor are they especially site-specific, a descriptor she told me she hates. In Marfa, reading Nagy Nelson's book on the New York School Poets, she noticed the phrase, an abundance of local detail, and that described her own work much better, she thought. Photographs of Kate's work strike me as being remnants of investigations, investigations that entail shifting things around in order to see a disruption of habit. Newby travels a lot for her work, and a great deal of it is created in places she's seeing for the first time. By describing Kate's work, I shadow her process. It's a descent into deep observation. And through this descent, you shed all the surface emotion and chatter that surrounds daily life. You can see a lot just by looking. She recalls a guy named Lynn saying about dirt in an ecology workshop she went to. And this kind of shadowing feels like a discipline, not an evasion. I need experiences and situations in order to generate work, Kate emailed from Marfa December 6th. Not in a way where I want to make something all on my own, but something in front of me. I'm also doing stuff like leaving works outside so they age and absorb the weather or the shower water or whatever it is that's going on around it. I get a lot out of this idea of the work doing something, doing more than just sitting there, but I lose control of it at some point. It's so cold here, and I just heated up a turkey pot pie. Outside my kitchen window this morning, a Wednesday, December 27th, I watch a large doe push the smaller of two fawns away from the feed we put out on the hill once a day. Dicking her hooves into the ground, the doe lunges violently forward, and the smallest fawn backs away. When we moved here last summer, Philip and I thought by feeding the deer during the long winter, we could protect them when hunting season came round again. By then, they'd be used to our yard. Our home in Bovey, Minnesota, transformed into a nature preserve, a deer sanctuary. But what began as a romance with nature has turned into a Darwinian nightmare. Because deer don't share their food, especially when it's scarce. Do not feed the deer, the pamphlet from the Department of Natural Resources warns. Deer do not share food. If insufficient food is available to feed all the deer, only the biggest and strongest will have access. The young, old, weak, smaller deer will be denied access. The survival of those deer without access to food may actually be decreased because they expend valu valuable energy trying to gain access. Instead of making things better, we've made them worse. We began feeding them in November after the first heavy snow. And now the feed, store, the feed store clerk tells us we have to feed them all winter until it greens up because they've come to depend on this food and won't know where else to go. I wish we'd never picked up that pamphlet. If we'd remained ignorant, we might still enjoy the few thrilling glimpses of deer that we caught throughout the summer while they foraged the roadside at dusk. Now they surround us, a brutal herd, and we are complicit. Life feels smothered, dampened, as if under a bushel or behind a mask. Impression of fog penetrating to the point of liquefaction. That's Michelle Lurie's War Diaries, June 6, 1941. And 
perhaps what characterizes the life circumstances forced me to lead at the moment is the absence of a future that restricts anxiety as much as it does hope. Nothing exists except the present, but a present in which one does not feel, for lack perhaps, of that future so vital to balancing out in us what the past has crushed. Fine powdery snow fell for most of the morning. Kate Newby's exclusion of horror is willful, deliberate. Her work leads viewers to the kind of sleep-drenched perception you have in your first waking moments when your mind is still clear and you haven't yet reached for a screen or run through your day. A button, an acorn, a playlist, a mushroom, a bead. Bovey, Minnesota, December 17th to 27th. And I'll stop there. Thanks. So, yeah, questions or comments, please. I have the microphone. Just one mention that uh, Kate Newby actually had a show in Bergen uh, last autumn at the Hordeland Kunstcenter. Um, it was also a beautiful show. For those who saw it, might have recognized some of her working methods and use of materials. Yeah. Uh, yes, good. So listen, I'll I'm not going to hear you well, so I'm going to walk around and show you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for your, your presentation. Um, uh, you, you, you finished the whole thing by saying that nothing exists except the present. And uh, while reading your uh, different uh, works, um, namely uh, Torpor and Summer Fate, and uh, maybe uh, Where Art Belongs, yeah. uh, I noticed that <coughs> that um, space, or I don't know if that's, that's like a, a real category <laughs> at all, but, but that space is occupying some kind of interesting uh, space <laughs> in your, in your uh, relation to, to the art scene and art itself. Like, Space now art needs a space in a way, yeah. uh, and and um, and in your critique and in your relation to art, I think that I, I find that that uh, space is a very important uh, term. Uh, or, or yeah. Yeah. Uh, is is that a question or? <laughs> no, I think it's a really interesting statement, though. And when you say that thing, you know. I guess sort of quoting me about work existing only in the present. I mean, it's interesting that those all, every time I mentioned that, and that phrase recurred, I realized several times this evening, they all describe kind of traumatic situations. Michel Larisse was writing about the present only existing. He's living in occupied France at the time during World War II. And Lucy Stahl, talking about this kind of confusion of the presence, is her not speaking the language well and living in Los Angeles being very adrift and confused and seeing only the surface and so deciding to manifest the surface, the present. So yeah, there's something about, there's something about that state of living in the present that isn't an altogether happy state. Yeah. <laughs> Um, perhaps people have questions or comments about the nature of art writing and the dialogue that the writer enters into with the artist and what is the transaction between the writer and the artist. That was actually my next question. I wanted you to elaborate on, <laughs> not that you just laid it out there, um, the role of correspondence within your work and how you build upon that. Yeah, actually, both of those, both of those essays that I read entailed correspondences. Um, so, and why do I do that? Because I feel like I'm writing for the artist, so I want to be sure I get it right. 
and all I have to work with are these JPEGs in front of me. So I definitely want to be in dialogue with them about what they were thinking about when they made the work. You know, I don't think that's cheating. You know, there's that Philistine idea that contemporary art is this great mystery that like you're charged with deciphering. But I feel like the more I know about what the artist is thinking at the time they're making it, the better. I mean, there's always so many stories that, you know, hidden or buried within an artwork. And I really like the idea of kind of pulling them out and excavating them. And the dialogue, the dialogue with the artist is one part of it. I mean, probably everybody in this room is an artist or is in the art world in some way, right? So there's that format of the studio visit where that often happens. You know, the studio visit can be such an amazingly intimate and profound kind of conversation where two people are standing in front of an artwork and kind of bringing out the story of the work in words, kind of free associating in front of the work. I mean, I do that. I mean, I usually start a studio visit by just feeding back in words what I'm seeing. And then the artist may say something about what they were thinking or what they were reading or looking at leading up to that. And what begins as being a very kind of mute, impenetrable object suddenly becomes, contains the whole world and it grows. So I think every reading of a work amplifies it. So I try to do that as best as I can. Making, making you run too, sorry. Hey. Um, yeah, I, w I was interested, um, you made a point that reminded me of something I heard about uh, uh, somebody r making a critical review of an exhibition she hadn't actually seen. And you were talking about the idea of writing about work that you haven't encountered directly. So I was quite interested in the hierarchy of encounter with the work. Um, you mean... Are you saying that, is like, there how can you really have an encounter with a work when you're just seeing the JPEG? Not necessarily, because most people, like you say in the room, have some, maybe, a role in the art world. And we've all gone through a training where we've learned to write about things we haven't seen. Right. So I'm interested if you think there is a hierarchy of encounter. Is there a... Hierarchy of encounter. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I definitely see it. I'd definitely rather see it for real. Um, although, I think maybe that's truer in the case of painting and work that's materially based, work that is just conceptual. You know, whether you're seeing it on the computer or you're seeing it installed, you know, the important thing is you kind of get the concept, you get what they're doing, you get the references. It's not a material, physical encounter. And so it doesn't really matter as much. But definitely with, you know, with, with painting or sculpture or stuff that like exists spatially, yeah, it's really important to be there. It really adds so much. I mean, it, it, was, it was reminded me of this situation where this curator is, uh, or the reviewer was based in one city in another Scandinavian country and she was asked to review an exhibition in another. I mean, that's a huge lot of different works to review. So quite complex. <laughs> it happens all ask. the time. But I mean, often pe when people agree to review the show, it's because they've already seen the artist's work at some point. They may not have seen this particular exhibition, but at some point they've seen the work for real. And then you just pretend you've seen the show. You bring, you bring your qualification. Yeah, yeah. I just, I reviewed a show of uh, an artist friend in Mexicali um, recently for Art Forum, then I'll come out soon. And uh, so that was a long drive down there from LA to Mexicali, five and a half hours. Um, but I'm really glad I did it. It was a painting show, and I definitely could have said, just send me the JPEGs. But like being in the museum in Mexicali, seeing who goes to the exhibition there, the school kids in their uniforms, just the whole vibe of the State Museum in Mexicali, as well as seeing the paintings installed, that really gave me a feeling that I never would have had just looking at the images.
Thanks. Um, I have a question about the, the role of the diary in your writing and the importance for you for this personal voice that you bring in in relation to the art writing. The role of the diary. Um, I kind of naively, I mean, maybe I've gotten over this, grown out of it, but I always used to feel like I was kind of getting away with something when I would write for somebody's catalog. You know, because you get paid nothing to write an art review, and you get paid relatively quite well to write a catalog essay. So, you know, they're paying me, like, whatever a word. Okay, I'm going to just shovel it in. <laughs> <laughs> the less work I have to do to make this money, the better. And there's all this writing there for the taking in my diary. So I think I'm really kind of getting away with something, kind of robbing my own diary and putting it in the essay. But... In fact, it doesn't turn out to be as cynical as that because there really is like a subconscious dialogue that goes on with the work, especially with Lucy Stahl. That was so bizarre. You know, my diary kept like ricocheting off of the things that she was sending me. And it was like we were having this sort of witchy transference across continents. But yeah, I mean, I have, I mostly do keep a diary all the time, and that's where all my writing begins anyway. So yeah, of course I'm going to rip off my own diary. So, sorry. Maybe we do one or two more, depending on the length. Now, I was just curious to know um, how you felt about the TV show that Joe Sola did and your adap the adaptation of your writing to, to the TV show, if you could talk about your relation to that. What show are we talking about? I love Dick. I love Dick. Oh, the TV yeah. show. Yeah. What about it? How do you feel about this adaptation of, the, of your writing into, into the show? Well, it was an adaptation for sure. Um, I think, you know, if you wanted to adapt the book into a sitcom, you couldn't have done a better job. They did a beautiful job. If I were to adapt the book, though, it would be more like a Michael Haneke movie. So, you know, <laughs> I was a good sport. So it's kind of a follow-up to the question around the diary. I had a question about your approach to talking uh, about things from a personal level. Um, do you feel that this gives some of the statements that you're trying to make, uh, do you feel that protects you in some way when you, when you, when you write from this personal level? I'm, I'm thinking particularly in books like Torpor where you talk about this experience of being uh, with Guattari and this is kind of, there's this criticism of this uh, old French school of philosophy that's inherent in that. Um, and you're able to make these big statements from this personal approach, but do you feel because it's rooted in this kind of authentic experience that, that gives you some type of protection to be able to make these types of statements? Oh, do you think that by writing from one's own, from my own experience, I'm protecting myself? I'm just opening up the possibility. No, but of that. I mean that never occurred to me because people would usually say the opposite. They would say by writing from your personal experience, you're exposing yourself. But I'm talking more in protecting the fact that the idea is authentic and is rooted in a personal experience. Do you understand what the angle that I'm... Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> I mean, kind of. Um, if it's rooted, then... Uh, no, I, I, I'm ha having a hard time with that. Because, I mean, if you're talking about, well... I mean, I'm not a philosopher, right? So doing philosophy, that's another thing where people are working purely with ideas. Um, I am more of a writer, you know, and I guess within my art writing, I see myself more like a journalist, you know, sort of a higher kind of journalist. Um, and so that's kind of trying to communicate a lot of complicated ideas in a very accessible way so that the most possible people can understand them. So to use my own personal experience in that way, I think it's very helpful because it makes it more accessible to people. But if I was writing pure philosophy, obviously I couldn't do that. That would be another kind of endeavor. Thank you. 
should we call it a day? Because we have, um, actually, the bookshop is still open, and we have, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, there's a lot of books uh, by Chris and uh, other new arrivals uh, out there. The bookshop is open, uh, and Chris also agreed to sign books, oh, dedicate definitely. books for those uh, who want, which is always a popular and nice gesture. And um, in addition, then closing the evening, I wanted to um, mention two upcoming events. The first one this Saturday, another event in um, uh, the series of uh, evenings, events that we organized around the exhibition of Jill Johnston. This time uh, it's uh, on Saturday, 8th of June at 3 o'clock. It's a workshop and discussion with um, the Swedish artist, filmmaker, activist uh, Petra Bauer who is organizing this workshop uh, inspired by a series of uh, political gatherings that Jill Johnston organized in the 1970s in colleges across um, the, um, um, the US, uh, which were for women to discuss the political role of women. So it's an, uh, a workshop about political feminist uh, activism. Uh, and then on the... Tw uh, yeah. This workshop requires sign-up, and all information regarding this is uh, available in our program booklet, then, um, and on our website. And uh, then on 12th uh, of June, um, a Wednesday, we have uh, the second evening in our new series of films called Zoom. It's a film by the Otterlith Group um, called The Third Part of the Third Measure, and it's a film... Uh, an artistic and project film that's uh, uh, looking into the militant minimalism of avant-garde composer, pianist, and uh, vocalist Julius Eastman. It's a fantastic uh, musician, and it's a great film uh, that we're showing uh, 12th of June at 8 o'clock, again here at uh, Landmark at Bergen Kunsthal. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, it was an amazing evening, and uh, please enjoy the rest of the evening here at the bar or the bookshop. Thank you. And thank you, Chris, so much for coming. <laughs>